This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest Blood Red Podcast with myself, Sean Bradbury, in the hosting seat. Plenty to go out today with an action-packed weekend in store. And it sounds bizarre to say this in early August, but we have the exciting prospect of Liverpool friendly to look forward to and also the small matter of a Champions League final. And we'll get on to both of those things and to help me have a go at all that and more, I'm delighted to be joined by three of the Echo's finest. First of all, we have um, on red duties for us for the last couple of days, Connor Dunn. Connor, how are you keeping? I'm very well, thank you, Sean. How are you? Not bad, mate. Not bad at all. Yeah, doing good, doing good. Uh, we also have live from Sonny Birkenhead, Kiva O'Neill. Kiva, how's tricks? I'm good, but if you follow me on Twitter, you'll know the many mixed emotions because I've finished The Sopranos and just feel quite empty with my life. Oh, it's it. Well, I was going to say what do you think about the ending, but we probably best not spoil it for people. That is, yeah. I think, as, as all okay, series yeah. go, that that's the one that left me the most bereft when it finished. Just, it's just so good, isn't it? I'm lost. <laughs> I'm sure you'll recover. Uh, and last but not least, I'm tempted to just talk about The Sopranos now for half an hour, to be honest. But, um... <laughs> I mean, I'll be logging off, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also have direct from the south end of Liverpool, Dan Kay. Dan, how are you keeping? I'm all right, and you keep us putting an idea in my head. I usually tend to watch The Sopranos, re-watch it back maybe every couple of years. I think I've probably watched it all the way through maybe four or five times now, but probably am due another wow. one. So I'd say give yourself, give yourself a year or two and then watch it back and you get even more out of it next time. But in a footballing sense... Um, <laughs> yes, it, we're near, you know, it's, it's mid-August, yes. Nor- normally Liverpool would have yes. played a couple of games by now, but it's nice to have um, a couple of pre-season friendlies to look forward to, and you know, this time next week, mad though it sounds, we'll be talking about the Charity Shield, or oh, sorry, the Community Shield, it's, it's called these Absolutely, yeah. it is, uh, it's all upon us, isn't it, it's going to come thick and fast. Um, well, one thing we got yesterday was the fixtures, um, and Connor and Paul Wheelock had, had a good chat about those on a, a separate podcast yesterday, so we won't go into this in depth, but just just a quick look over that, um, and a little bit of reaction from you guys who obviously haven't spoken about it yet. Dan, we'll start with you, first up for the Reds, it's uh, 30 Leeds. Bit of a shame that there'll, there'll be no fans there because obviously it's a it's a great start, that isn't it? It's a, it's a big tie. Um, what's your take on that then? Happy happy with that one to get it going? Well, I'm I'm happy that it's the home one rather than the away one because uh, I've always enjoyed going to Ellen Rose. I think maybe that's part. Of, I think maybe the generations one or two ahead of me maybe didn't quite have quite as much fun there as what we did because you from all accounts used to be quite a dicey place to go in the 60s and 70s. But it's one of the greater one of the greater away days. One of the great rivalries of English football really Liverpool and Leeds so I, you know, I, I've been rooting for them to get back in, into the Premier League for a long time it'll be it'll be an interesting game you know, it, it's never easy I always think playing against the newly promoted sides you want to play against them generally when they've had a little bit of bad optimism beaten out of them after after a couple of weeks or months mm. uh, it's going to be fascinating to see Marcelo Bielsa in the Premier League you know I don't know too much about him but you know, the articles I've read the, the bits bits I've seen he looks like a fascinating football character that I think is really going to add a lot to the kind of the rich tapestry of of our football. Um, so it'll be fascinating to see them at Anfield. But you know, Liverpool are the the champ. Yeah, you know, we, we can still say this for another forty eight hours: champions of the world, champions of Europe, champions of England. We don't need to fear anyone. Um, but yeah, it'll be it'll be really exciting to see um, two of the great Northwest rivals kicking the season off in, in a few weeks' time. Mm. Kiva, there's been a fair bit of talk about the start in general and, and how tough it is. I think uh, we just put a piece up online there with some of our sister sites and writers there, and they're all kind of predicting, well, most of them are predicting City will be top after 10 games. When you look at those first four games, you've got Leeds, Leeds home, Chelsea away, Arsenal home and Villa away. Are, are you daunted by that opening run, or do you think the, the Reds will swagger into those with the strut of champions? Yeah, I mean... Yeah. I think last season you were sort of looking at the fixtures in the same way, thinking, oh, you know, each game, even Norwich, the opening game, you were kind of thinking it's Friday night, the newly promoted, which would be the same sort of feeling with Leeds, I think. Just a shame, as Dan says, the fans won't be there. And indeed, Liverpool fans, just to, you know, see that Bielsa versus Klopp, uh, part one. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I think it's, they're going to be tough games, aren't they? Obviously, like every game is going to be, but I think you've just got to get that, that Leeds win under your belt, I think that's massively important for Liverpool because you can see how almost Leeds could, you know, do a job on Liverpool there with no crowd to sort of play against, you know. Um, but then rolling into the likes of Chelsea and Arsenal, you're thinking, you know, 
Timo Werner, you're getting a little bit like, oh, hang on a minute, you know, would he would he do something that would, you know, start the season in a in you know fashion that Liverpool wouldn't quite want to start it off in? But then you look at last season and you just think, as Dan mentions there, we can keep saying the champions of everything. And, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to those first few games just to be like, you know, I think when Arsenal always come around in particular, you're always those games home and away, you always sort of worry about them and then we almost seem to just blow Arsenal out the water. So I'm hoping that it's a similar sort of affair this time round. And I think, you know, Chelsea haven't quite fixed that defence yet, have they? So I think Liverpool should hopefully have a field day. That that 5 free game was spectacular, wasn't it? Um, so, you know, hopefully we'll we'll be on the, on the right side of the results. Mm. I think I view the fixture start a little bit differently. I don't know. Obviously, Leeds haven't been in the Premier League since 2004. Not going to be used to the intensity of it, for sure. They're going to come up against the most, or second most at least, intense team probably in world football other than City. And if Liverpool go all guns blazing for that 90 minutes against Leeds, I don't think they're going to have enough to cope at all. Especially considering Liverpool's pre-season, which we'll obviously come on to, and the calibre of opponents and the way they can prepare probably better than a lot of teams. And then, as Everybody knows new signings don't always necessarily bed straight in. Playing Chelsea really early while they haven't bought a defender, while Timo Werner is still finding his feet in the Premier League, might be really beneficial. Going to Stamford Bridge with no crowd, you know, lots of, I think there's lots of nuances that help Liverpool here. Mm. So, interesting point that about Leeds. I think, I think you've seen that sometimes in, in Champions League games where teams have, you know, maybe from a slightly inferior league and then come up against Liverpool and then the, that intensity is kind of blowing them away. So, yeah, stepping up from the Championship could be could be a similar sketch, fingers crossed. But before we move on then, Con, obviously, as we said before, you, you've already had your say on the fixtures, but after those first four, you've got the international break and then straight after that is a very, very early derby. What, what do you make of that uh, Goodison tie being so early in the season? Well, we were discussing before the podcast started, weren't we, that it's exactly 10 years to the day since Everton last beat Liverpool. Um, that was when Roy Hodgson was in the dugout. We had like Koncheski at left back, and Liverpool were in all sorts of trouble. I think only out of the relegation zone by goal difference at that stage. So no, yeah, they were they were in the bottom three. Well, in the bottom three, yeah. Oh, yeah I know it was super game, close. Nineteenth after it. It was just oh. an outrageous time, especially and then. But you consider what's happened over the last decade and how good Liverpool and how well Liverpool have done with recruitment, with getting Klopp, with everything that's followed, and the. The chasm between the two clubs now is massive. And again, I know look, government are reportedly looking to get fans back into stadiums at the start of January, but it will be limited capacity. Goodison won't have that bay in atmosphere and that won't help the Everton players at all, albeit in not ideal circumstances for football fans around the world. But it's just a fact and reality of this season at the moment, isn't it? So, yeah, it's an interesting one to have such an early derby and an interesting nuance that, you know, it's 10 years to the day, but... I just don't see them having enough at all to even get a result. <laughs> Fingers crossed. We, we shall see when that one rolls around. Um, right, well, let's move then on to the, the first instalment of the of the weekend's action, which is, of course, the friendly tomorrow afternoon against Stuttgart. Um, all of about, what, four weeks since we've seen the, the Reds back in action. Uh, and opponents will be, will be buzzing after their recent promotion back to the Bundesliga. And just want to ask you all, really, I mean, obviously, we'll, I think we'll hear more later on today and tomorrow, obviously, about team news and things like that. So, you know, specifics are all to come. But I think this is quite an interesting one in terms of priorities because, obviously, Klopp will want to get the players tuned up for the Community Shield, as Dan mentioned before. And fitness is just a little bit different at this at this stage of the season and, and given this particular campaign because, obviously, we've seen all the dispatches and the pitches and, and the vids from training in Austria over the last few days. And it does all look like it's not really a typical pre-season fitness building sessions. It's more like early season sessions, drills, work with the ball, all that type of thing. And you've got the community shield, but then you've got this this two-week gap until when the season starts properly. Um, the transfer window is obviously open, isn't it, and goes all the way till October. And you might normally think Klopp would want to put a couple of players in, in the shop window, but that, there's a lot more time there. So I just think it's it's an interesting one, really. What what do you make of this tomorrow, Con, in a, in a general sense, in terms of what Klopp's priorities will be for this game? Well, I think as you said there, Stuttgart are going to be buzzing the fact they're back in the Bundesliga and they're going to want to test their own metal against the calibre of Liverpool. So they will be a really decent opponent for Klopp to put his players up against. It's a really good test, a really strong, really high level of opposition, um, obviously playing them away on the continent. I don't think it will quite be 
like a friendly as you would know them sometimes in pre-season because because of the season to such a short pre-season because the, the actual season is starting so soon both teams want to get in and go for hell for leather and really test what they've got and where they're at and it's a really good opportunity for Liverpool fans and obviously the manager to see exactly where his players are at in terms of fitness, exactly how long they're lasting at the moment, what he needs to work on. And then obviously we'll come on to Salzburg, which is coming next week. But that's another type of test again against high calibre opposition. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a big opportunity Stuttgart and it's a, it's, a decent, it's a decent level of opposition considering how short a turnaround and time frame they had to organise that. Mm, absolutely. How about you, Kiva? Is there anything in particular you're you're hoping to see tomorrow? It's just it's just a weird one, isn't it? Because you know, at this stage, normally you'd expect well, the season would be well underway. So, and and they are a little bit further ahead, you'd think, in terms of fitness than they'd normally be. So it's it, it could be quite an exciting game. Yeah, I mean, it's I think it's one club probably always wanted, isn't it? Um, with it being as you know, his boiled club that him and his family have supported. Um, so I think he's probably always had it marked, hasn't he, Dan, that he wants to get a, a pre-season in against them, uh, Stuttgart. But yeah, I think it's a weird one because you're kind of thinking, you know, usually we're used to pre-season in America or wherever. And it's always, you know, so many games within so many days in different cities. And, you know, this is very much just going to be in the one sort of place, I imagine. And then, you know, two, two, we're only getting real two looks at them, aren't we? And then... You know, it's going to be onto the charity shield, I assume. And um, it's interesting because usually we have like 45 minutes of a whole 11 and then another 45 minutes of a whole other team. But I don't know whether that'll be Klopp's plan this time around. You'd think it would be to give everyone, you know, a, a good 45 minute run up. But does he start maybe, maybe it's more so in the Salzburg game where he starts looking at us, you know, as more of his 11 or testing out sort of, it's a good chance, isn't it, to test out the plays that you, a little bit maybe unsure of who haven't quite won the place yet. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised tomorrow if you if you don't see that 11 and then another 11 and you see maybe, you know, the first a few changes and, you know, um, till about 60 minutes and then, you know, sort of one of them where it's like nine players come on, which is always an enjoyable sight, isn't it? Um, but yeah, you, you know, looking forward to just seeing them back in action and seeing sort of what level they're at, as you say, because all the pictures and videos we're seeing, it looks like they're at, the work and at like you know sort of season level here in, in training it doesn't look kind of like you know the fun sort of like stretching and the yoga and the nice little relaxing stuff mm -hmm. I'm sure they're doing that as well but it, it seems quite intense stuff so maybe you know Liverpool are wanting to sort of use this as a little sort of you know a run at you know what's going to be the league the Premier League season and you know looking at them fixtures it's going to be insane isn't it you know with all the cup competitions and the Champions League as soon as Liverpool gets started tomorrow, the season just like literally won't end forever. Probably it's going to be one of them. And, you know, especially with hearing reports from across Europe of, you know, coronavirus cases and matches being cancelled. I don't think we're probably thinking into it because we don't want it to happen. But I do think maybe matches and stuff will be suspended. And it's probably going to be almost a way of the season from start to finish than last season was because at least we got to March and then the world started ending. Um, but I think the world's kind of still, you know, in that little moment, isn't it? So it's gonna gonna be interesting, you know. Fingers crossed, it can just it can just be a start to finish thing. But I've got a little feeling in the back of my mind it might not be as simple as that. Mm. Dan, I don't think there's much point us us running through a full team selection because, like like the guys have said, it's likely to be one way. We'll we'll, we'll see a mix. We'll see lots of substitutions. Obviously, there's the second friendly coming up, as, as Connor said before, in a few days' time. But is there any one or anything you're looking forward to seeing particularly tomorrow? Well, you know, Liverpool have signed a new footballer, haven't they? Um, you know, our new Greek left-back, Kostas Simikas. So I think all Liverpool fans will be looking forward to, to having, you know, a first glimpse of him in a red shirt and, and how he performs. I agree with what, you know, Kiva and Conor have said. I think, um, you know, whereas in the past, certainly the first th two or three Friendly, uh, friendly games of each pre-season and they normally play what probably between six and eight or nine per summer you, you know you would nearly always yeah. see 22 players at least used you know two separate 11 obviously that's not feasible or practical or necessary because you know as has been pointed out it, it's not long since the last season finished they essentially only had two weeks off and you'd imagine they're so professional and so disciplined this Liverpool lot that even when they were on the jollies, I think I think we carried a video of Virgil Van Dijk doing a bit of training in Greece or somewhere where, where mm. when he was on his holidays, and 
you'd imagine most of them would have been keeping themselves ticking over. We, we've had a piece on the website this morning from Ginny Wijnaldum saying that this preseason, you know, basically confirming that this, this preseason has been, the way he described it, less than the others in terms of intensity with running because there's a lot of football. So it, it's, you know, unfortunately, I, I would also concur with what Kiva said there. I, I do think that there's, if I was a betting man, I think it's highly likely that at some point, some matches will be called off, whether they're in Europe, whether they're European competition matches or in the Premier League, because, you know, unfortunately, the coronavirus pandemic is as desperate as everybody is to get back to some kind of normality. Um, it is still a thing. It is still a very dangerous threat to to, to human life. And, and you know, I, there's, there's no point predicting anything like that, but I think we have to prepare ourselves for that eventuality. What's what's encouraging is that, you know, and it's actually tied into another piece that I've written for the website this morning about the kind of the scientific and analytical approach that Klopp in particular and his backroom staff take with Liverpool. And to be fair, is now fairly widespread across the game. They have the numbers, they have the data to be able to manage players' football, to, to manage people to manage players' fitness in these unusual rhythms, in this kind of stop-start thing. And I think, you know, you're never going to eradicate injuries or, you know, pulls and strains as part of the game. But I think we've seen over the last couple of years that, by and large, Liverpool have managed to keep most of their key players fit, uh, and I'm sure mm. part of that is due to the due to the the work, the analysis, the scrutiny that they're all put under to make sure that you know when they when they, what do they call it the red zone when players are in that kind of danger area where they might be maybe more susceptible to picking up knocks, then they can be maybe be prevented from that. Now, bearing in mind there's so much football squeezed into such a short space of time over this proposed new season that that might cause another, another issue there but um i think for tomorrow it's just a case of getting them into some kind of competitive action again hopefully giving the likes of simicass and you know some of the other younger players a run out and you know just getting them fine tuning the fitness ahead of um you know the chance for more silverware at wembley next saturday i think one thing to look out for um tomorrow against stuttgart is nat phillips obviously spent last season on loan with Stuttgart, helped them back into the Bundesliga. I know that he's one that Liverpool are open to putting out on another loan deal or even leaving permanently if clubs want to buy him. It's a bit of a chance for him in pre-season. You know, we talk about shop windows all the time against a club who know him, against a club he's played for. Obviously, he came back for that that match in the FA Cup, didn't he? Um, to give Liverpool a senior centre-back option. But, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one for him specifically, just for facing his, his old club that he spent last season on loan with and somebody who might be interested in bringing him back. And, Again, as we were talking about, you know, what might happen in the game and changes, I think this will be the game where you see most Liverpool changes, given the fact that they're probably the lesser of the two opposition of the friendlies before Arsenal. And Arsenal comes on the 29th of August. The league doesn't start till the 12th of September. There will definitely, I reckon, be another friendly in between that where Klopp can fine-tune things a bit more. So I think there'll probably be f four games if you include the Community Shield as a friendly. And this one might be the one where you see the most changes and the most most chance to see somebody like Simicass or the most chance to see a sort of a different formation or, or you know, Minamino going through the lines or something like that. We've mentioned a few names there, Kiva, and I think this is normally where you say Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, but is, is there anyone in particular, an individual you think who will be looking to make a point or prove anything um, tomorrow? A, a player I think I've been, you know, looking at in, in, when the pictures and the videos have come up is Marco Gruwich. You kind of think... What does his future hold? He's one of them players that sort of sprung to mind. Then when Connor said about, you know, Nat Phillips, and it is, you know, as you say, they had a shop window, and it feels like this game is almost the only chance to really, like, you know, push out these players and say, you know, look what we've got on offer here. And I think, you know, the teams that are looking at, to buy players like this will already have an inkling of who they are and that they want to buy them, but it's just such a, you know, a crazy time right now, isn't it, where the clubs want to spend money when, you know, it's, you know, it's not really safe to almost, is it, um, financially? Um, obviously, you look at the likes of Minamino. He looks like he's had a really good time in training, the, the stuff you're seeing from him. And, you know, I think he needed this almost, as I think I said last Friday, you know, it's, it's good these training camps because if you ever go away on holiday with your mates, you always come back and you've got, you know, those tales to tell. And I'm sure it's not, not quite the drunken nights that we've all experienced on holiday, but... You know, you have you have good stories to tell, and it's a real bond. You could go away with complete strangers on holiday, and literally, you know, four days with people, and you know, you know them, don't you? Um, so I feel like this is great for players like that, and obviously Costas as well. 
um, just to sort of integrate in the squad and, you know, find, like, it looks like Salah's almost took um, Simakas under his under his wing a little bit, which is nice. And Starting you know, maybe... on Salah, he looks massive, by the way. He looks so, yeah. he looks absolutely yeah. ripped. I've not, I've not seen him in a shape like that in these pictures. I'm so excited to see him just absolutely nail someone. <laughs> yeah, it's, he looks, his shoulders and his arms look like he's been working really hard. Maybe... Yeah. Maybe that's a thing, actually, to mention, because obviously they might have said, because I think people cottoned on a little bit to him, didn't they, of how, you know, you know how, how to sort of beat him maybe is to, you know, we know he can wriggle away, but if he's got bigger shoulders to sort of push defenders away, we might see a yeah. totally, you know, a massive improvement in that kind of area next season, because we know he's a dancer with his feet, don't we? And he's even more aerodynamic with his hair do now as well, isn't he? So he's going to be nice. <laughs> he's looking great, isn't he? Every time I see him, I'm like, who's that? Oh, uh, yeah, Salah. <laughs> well, yeah, it is going to be interesting to uh, see what kind of shape they're in and see who lines up tomorrow and indeed uh, against Salzburg early next week. Right, well, we'll move on to uh, Sunday's action then, which is, the, yeah, this bizarre prospect of a Champions League final on a, on a Sunday night towards the end of August. Um, but, yeah, this this little mini bubble tournament, I have to say, I've, I've really enjoyed this. It looked like there might be a couple of upsets and surprises along the way over the last few weeks, but arguably the two biggest guns left have, have shot their way to the final in quite different fashion, to be fair, but Bayern and PSG. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to get everyone's thoughts on this, how you see it going, how, how you'd like it to go almost as well, because obviously Liverpool, as we know, probably boasts the six European Cups. Bayern are just behind on five, aren't they? So they've got the opportunity to match up with Cali. PSG looking for their first one ever. They'll no doubt be going all out to secure it. Um, just go around the three of you then. Dan, to start with, what, what are your thoughts ahead of this one? Well, I'm really looking forward to me. And like you say, it is an unusual prospect, not least because it's a Champions League final without Liverpool in it, which, you know, <laughs> we've become a little bit accustomed, accustomed <laughs> to in uh, in recent years. I agree. I think by and large, it's been, I've, I've really enjoyed this tournament. I thought the four quarter finals were outstanding. Each one of them in their own way, kind of summing up the brilliant kind of cut, cut, uh, cutthroat and at times cruel nature of, of cup tie football, particularly the first one with Atalanta, who were, you know, minutes, you know, a minute away from, beaten PSG and got stung in stoppage time and you know what a story that would have been with with Bergamo being one of the absolute epicenters of the, mm. of the pandemic in Italy it would have been a lovely story for them obviously um we saw Liverpool's conquerors Atletico Madrid get knocked out in many ways kind of hoist by their own facade they are their own innate conservatism that that really should have cost them the tie against Liverpool you know cost them the tie there um Barcelona by Munich I think was one of those kind of football matches where it's almost like a bit of a JFK moment where your your people will remember what they were doing because it was it was just such a jaw dropping experience um, to see just not the kind of I think you know I expected Bayern to win but not like nothing to that deal not to humiliate them like that and then Manchester City against Leon which you know I think it's fair to say uh, plenty of Liverpool fans would have taken a fair degree of of satisfaction in um, obviously City's whole ownership. And, you know, whole kind of raise on debt in recent times has been to win that Champions League. And Liverpool, I think supporters quite rightly, re you know, regard being European champions as the absolute cream of the crop. You know, it's a very, very special elite band to be in. And, you know, you've really got to you know, earn your corn to, to, to do that and get in there. So the fact they weren't able, they weren't able to do that, um, you know, obviously, there's also potential knock on effect for them for next season. You know, how will that affect their confidence? Um, you know, as well as playing a little bit later, we know they're going to start their um, their league campaign. Well, they're going to miss the first game, so they'll have a little bit of time to get juice back in the legs. But the fact of the matter is, you know, they finished 18 points behind Liverpool. They still haven't reached the semi-final under Guardiola, let alone um, uh, a final or won it. <laughs> in, in terms of who would like to win it, for me, it'd be Bayern. I mean, I'm not going to start going into Paris Saint-Germain's Saint ownership and the concept of sports washing and all that kind of business. For me, it goes back to what happened in Munich uh, last March. Um, it was a Liverpool winning 3-1 there in the, the second leg like, of the last 16. Was it, for my money, an enormous moment in the journey under Klopp. It's easy to forget that as, as awesome as Liverpool were that uh, last season, they actually had they actually went into that game under a little bit of a they had a bit of a bit of a bad spell. I checked it out just before. I think they'd only won three out of the last seven. Now they'd drawn the other four. But by last season's standards, that was a little bit of a slump. You know, mm. there's two disappointing draws at Goodison Park and Old Trafford. And going there and winning in the manner that they did, I think, was was a huge moment in kicking on and obviously winning the Champions League and winning the league this year. 
as much as anything else, one of the reasons I kind of treasure memories of that day as well is that I was uh, fortunate to get a ticket through a mate um, for the match, but, but we were sitting with the Bayern Munich fans. And, you know, you, I've, I've supported you know, Liverpool in, in a home ends up and down the country in the ball for years, but you never quite know how it's going to be. And you've always got to kind of, you know, just be a little bit cautious and watch your surroundings. But it, it couldn't have been more welcome. We, we were able to kind of support our teams, get up and, you know, cheer our goals respectfully, you know, not taking the mick. And, and at the end, obviously, plenty, you know, plenty of them had got off by the time the final whistle went. But a few actually came over to us and said, you know, well done, good luck for the final. And, you know, personally, I could think of, even even if obviously they will, if they were to win it, they draw level with us on six all. And that would make a, a rematch next season, you know, a very mouth-watering prospect. Um, I could think of no better team really to succeed us as European champions as, as Bayern. So that's who I'll be rooting for on, on Sunday. Mm -hmm. I think I'm with Dan Connor. I'd, I'll, I'll be rooting for Bayern, but I've got a sneaky feeling for PSG. I just think after, after that Atalanta game, it almost felt like it's one of them where like the, the fairy tale's there for them, if you like. And I've uh, been impressed with them, especially because their league ended quite a while ago. Neymar's looked excellent, apart from actually finishing his chances. You know, he's, he's looked otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's looked otherwise good. They look pretty solid. And just think if anyone can soak it up from Bayern and, and, and go at them at the other end, it's PSG. But well, we'll see on Sunday. But yeah, how, how do you see this one shaping up? I think Bayern have looked absolutely ruthless. I think the fact that PSG in that Atalanta game, I know they stung them in 90 and 92 minutes with two goals, but they weren't great during that game, to be fair. I know Neymar's got good feet, but, you know, Bayern have got like people like Kimmich, who has been sensational. And I just think the way they performed, you know, for any team to take apart Barcelona like that, they've got to have something about them. I also quite enjoy the fact that it is Bayern who are looking so good, considering everybody said last year that they were past it over the hill, this nobody team when Liverpool beat them in their own backyard. I don't I don't see any other result than Bayern, to be honest with you. Um, you can't really buy a pedigree in Europe, um, and that's what obviously PSG and City have tried to do. I don't want to get into it fully because it's one of, I said, another conversation for not this time but I just think with the way Bayern are with the pedigree they have in Europe with the history they have with this competition similar way to Liverpool they know how to win they know what it takes in a big Champions League final and I just think they're going to have a bit more than PSG do although just to add about the competition I love the format <laughs> the format is so so exciting you generally find I think over two legs the way it has always been the best team will come out as the winner in the end, but this just adds a bit more intrigue, a bit more excitement, a bit more, a bit more something. But I don't know if it will stay or not. I, I, I kind of hope it doesn't, but I've enjoyed it for what it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you there. I, I thought it would lead to lots of really cagey games, but it's had more of a maybe it's, it's just, just like a quality a, on show. But, you 90 know, minute there. shootout between amazing players, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we take that every week, wouldn't we? Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um, Kiva, before we move on, then we, we were talking about this earlier in the week, but. How are you? How will you be watching this one on Sunday? What will you be thinking? And what will you be thinking if uh, Coutinho makes an appearance? Yeah, I mean, I've started off the podcast with mixed emotions, and I've definitely got them coming up to this weekend. You know, when I saw Coutinho in action against Barcelona, you know, I, I was I enjoyed seeing him score that brace and just having that moment for himself. You know, he wasn't able to do that at Anfield, was he, last season? But he's almost been able to do it against Barcelona, which is obviously his parent club. And I did feel unbridled joy for him. I was just happy for him because of the way he's been treated, you know, over the past couple of seasons at Barcelona. I think, you know, they've spent all this money on him and then they haven't really, you know, wanted to make him the the the, more, the main guy. Or, you know, obviously you're never going to be with Messi, but they've never sort of put that weight on his shoulders that he, he had at Liverpool. And, you know, he has struggled, but he looks like he's going to be coming off smelling roses, doesn't he, this weekend? Because I can't see past Bayern Munich, you know, as the lads alluded to there with PSG. We don't need to get into it because, you know, it is a little bit unsettling, sort of, as much as you like to watch Neymar and Kylian Kill Mbappe play. And it's so enjoyable to watch PSG at times. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if they did do a number on Bayern because they're, they're more than capable of doing that. But, um, yeah, I just think Bayern are a proper club and, as much as I don't want anyone to sort of, I don't want them to to level it on six of us. I'd like us to stay out front. But, you know, they are, as I've said there, they're a proper club. And, I, you know, I think if anyone's going to win it, I'd probably like to see them do it. Um, but it just is that little bit of the thing with Coutinho, seeing him with the European Cup. I think it's, I'll, I'll be happy for him, but it'll be emotional thinking, 
you know, I'm just glad Liverpool sort of got there first to do it. Other than that, because you know he's he's gone to Spain, won two titles, La Liga titles, and then he's won a Bundesliga now. And you know, he, he's he's won a lot of silverware. He left Liverpool to do that, and he's done that. So no one can take that away from him. Has he played the part that he would have liked to play? Probably not. But you know, he's still got them them medals to look back on in years to come, hasn't he? And a lot of people will you know go to their moments against Barcelona, and that'll be as you know. His highlights three will be chock alone it really. Um but yeah, I think obviously because it's our cup right now and seeing him sort of have it in the pictures, of course I'm gonna retweet and like them and stuff, but I just feel like I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. It feels like you know, when it's like a breakup and it's a couple of years and then you see them with a new partner, I feel like the European Cup stars, it's gonna be a hard one to take. But no, I'll I'll be happy for them and do you know what? Bring them back. Wow. It's funny you should say that. Well, because <laughs> we, we will we will end we will end with a bit of fancy football. Um, as we've mentioned, yeah, Barca got absolutely walloped by Bayern, uh, and and the way of coming out of the club is that wholesale changes are needed. The identity needs to be refreshed. Only a select number of players are kind of now exempt from from uh, potentially being sold. I think that the likes of Messi, Griezmann, De Jong, Ter Stegen. There's there's like six or seven who um, that they come out and said are not up for sale. But other than that, it seems like it's kind of Fair game and open season to for other clubs to potentially raid them. Um, obviously that, that won't come easily. They'll they'll be expensive players with with big wages to pay. But yeah, obviously that this is fancy football stuff really in, in the current climate. But um, we'll, we'll go around the room and if you could have one, who would it be? Um, Dan K, start with you. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go for Gerard Piquet. He's got vast experience, a class player. He used to play for Man United, so it'd be a little bit of one in the eye for them. And imagine the content and the copy we get out of Shakira. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so it, t- it ticks a lot of boxes, I think. And um, yeah, so uh, PK would be the man for me. It's an interesting one, actually. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of him, but, but yeah, I, I like your arguments. Connor, who would you go for? He would be going for Coutinho. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, it is silly season, isn't it? Um, I did think about PK, for sure. Um, he makes a lot of sense. So is he 33? He's won 30 trophies nearly at Barca. He would bring crazy winning mentality. But I understand from the club that they're not looking at bringing in a centre-back right now. So I'll forget Samuel Ntiti as well and his injury record. And just for the romanticism of it, Luis Suarez, because imagine him as a backup to the front three, Louis back at Anfield. Forget all of the angst at Anfield and whatever else and what he said after he was sensational and I would love to see him for one more season because I reckon he's got a little bit more left I'm, I'm with Connor on this one no, normally I'd be saying Coutinho but the thought of a of a narky Suarez coming off the bench for the last 20 to replace one of that front three is is irresistible uh, Kiva go on final word to you is it Coutinho or are you going to surprise us right I'm completely breaking up with everyone have you asked me that yeah, go on, go on. <laughs> I think my wife. Well, no, I think Coutinho. I just, I, I think he's conquered things now, and he could come back. and And I think we we could do with a player like him in the ranks, you know. Um, but I think, like you say, there you do look at Suarez and think, he, what a special player he was for Liverpool. You know, he's still young enough to do a job, and I feel like Liverpool could do. I feel like. If you sign Coutinho, you, you're still not guaranteed to win the Premier League title next season. If you sign Suarez, I think I wouldn't have any doubts. I think Liverpool will win in the Premier League. I think he's got he's got a lot of history with the club. Obviously, missed out, didn't he, by, you know, in that horrible season, 2014. And, you know, I think he, that pain would probably drive him on. He'd come off the bench and just run riot, wouldn't he? And He's a winner. I mean, <laughs> start, start. Yeah, he's a, so, he's a winner. I mean, yeah. It has to be, you look at other players, other players maybe like Rakitic, I think could do a job for Liverpool. You know, Barca have so many good players, Busquets even, but, you know, you, you kind of look at the, I was looking through the squad before and just thinking, that's that's not a Barca squad anymore of what we used to. They, they used to be like from, you know, pillar to post, literally the best players in the world. And now it's totally not that way. So... It's gonna gonna be interesting. I think the whole world are watching now, aren't they, to see to see that transition? Mm, absolutely, is it's gonna be interesting to see if they can uh, reclaim the glories they've had over the last decade or two. Right, well, we'll leave it there, um, and we'll see at the end of this weekend if the Reds have kicked things off successfully, if Bayern have won the Champions League, and if Liverpool have signed Luis Suarez. 
Uh, we'll be back <laughs> on Monday to react to all of that uh, with the next Blood Red. So bye for now. <laughs>